Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to a Cisco chat, a DevNet story today, which is gonna be kind of awesome. We've got a lot of really cool content to talk about. Um, I don't wanna like bury the lead too far, but we got infrastructure as code. We've got just lots of other cool stuff. Um, and before I get to our two guests today on the show, which is gonna be awesome, um, I just wanna say good morning to all of you. And thank you so much for joining from all the different channels. I know we've got folks coming in from Twitter, Cisco.com, Facebook, YouTube, I mean, everywhere, including our new, um, video.cisco.com channel where uh, we're going to be answering live Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the show, I'll remind you of this consistently throughout the entire show. Don't worry. But if you have questions, put them in the chat wherever you're at, and our folks are going to be watching for that, and we'll get the questions fed in so that the second half of the show, we can go through some of those and just really make this a lot of fun for everybody. I hope you're all ready. This is going to be a lot of fun. So to introduce our two guests today, um, and I, I will let them do that because they can do much better justice than I can. First off, we have Susie Wee. Susie? Do you want to step in and introduce yourself? Hi there. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so Susie Wee, I'm the uh, SVP and CTO of Cisco DevNet. Uh, we founded DevNet about uh, seven or eight years ago. And the whole idea was to basically enable all of you, enable the world to use the technologies that we finally have available to us today, you know, of a programmable infrastructure, of having APIs, of having software, cloud applications, and everything meet the network. Uh, so super excited to chat with you all today. Excellent. Thank you for being here. And Quinn, why don't you go next? My name is Quinn Snyder. I'm a developer advocate within DevNet. I focus on all things DC networking. So traditional NXOS based things, ACI, MSO, and all of the, the new innovations that are coming out that specifically around, you know, again, not to bear the lead, the whole infrastructure as code movement and the speed and agility in the data center. Right. On. Thank you, man. Um, you know, and Susie, I wanted to kind of give a quick story because um, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I'm even here today is because many, several years ago, many, several years ago, when um, I've been at Cisco for like five and a half years at this point, um, well, I was at formerly GSX, now Impact, our big sales conference. I'm an SE. I'm sitting in the crowd next to a friend of mine. We loved doing Devon Express. We loved doing all these things. And you came on stage with Mike Coons at that time and said, we're announcing the DevNet Tiger team. And I saw that and he and I looked at each other like, oh, how do we get into this? And we at our manager, like texting our manager, like, dude, can you get us into this? And he's like, I, I already got you guys covered. Don't worry about it. And they're just like so excited. So to be at this point, sitting with you and Quinn and talking about these things is just going to be, it's just a dream come true. So I'm just oh. super stoked that we're here. <laughs> um, okay. So today we are talking about a lot of things. Um, the automation word gets thrown around constantly. I think it's a really big word. So we're going to try to break that down somewhat and focus in one corner of this today that you you teased a lot at Cisco Live and talked about in your keynote, infrastructure as code, and sort of break down what that means, how it can be practical for people in working for businesses, working for themselves, consultants, partners, whoever happens to just want to learn what these things mean. Uh, but before we get too far into sort of the questions about what this, what this could look like, I, I thought we'd step back a little bit and start with what I'd like to hear both of your definitions of what infrastructure as code actually is. Susie, why don't we start with you? Sure, yeah. Um, so what's interesting is to think about kind of what we're trying to achieve overall. And just one big um, area that people are, are very interested in is automation. So something that we know is that it's really important to automate, to automate your infrastructure. And the more you automate it and kind of digitize it, the more that you can do with it overall. And if we think about what automation meant, you know, just even five years ago, we think about what did automation mean, or even a few years ago, it meant reducing repetitive tasks. It meant um, getting rid of manual operations, being able to do things at scale, taking care of like human prone error, trying to minimize that as much as possible. But if we fast forward to today, what's cool is that your whole network, your whole infrastructure is programmable, and you can do all of those things plus more which means you can actually treat your infrastructure as software. And when you start to treat your infrastructure as code and as software, then you can use all of these software practices. So you can do version control, <laughs> you can do changes, you can do rollbacks, you can start to really manage at a very large scale. So to me, it's about applying all of those software practices that you do very easily in software, but applying that to your entire infrastructure as well. Right on. Quinn, is there anything you wanted to add into sort of like the semantics of that and what that what that may actually manifest itself physically for uh, folks watching? 
Yeah, I mean, so Susie talked a lot about being able to build things at scale, and we've got to remember, you know, the whole programmability movement infrastructure as code didn't really start until we had cloud economics. You had people that were, were spinning up these new servers in our cloud providers, but we don't want to wait two or three weeks for the provisioning teams and the software and app teams to really get through and, and build all that. So how can we make something very quick and repeatable? And I think the other the other important part that came out of that wasn't just we have this provider which does things. We want to have this multi-cloud environment where we can have portability of our apps and our infrastructure. And, and to get that, we need to have a layer of abstraction away from that. So while if you look at the pure definition of infrastructure as code, we're really focusing on how do we treat hardware like software with APIs and, and Python or mm -hmm. Go or whatever other programmability tool we want. To, to really get that level of speed and agility, we want to have a declarative type uh, semantic around that. So how do we abstract the nitty gritty of the infrastructure away from our code and make it portable across one or more, you know, public or private clouds. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you bring up because it's I when I was in sales specifically, but then also when I worked in organizations as a network engineer, I can remember conversations like this would come up where you'd hear before what we talk about now infrastructure as code was named as something or labeled. It was just like, how do we get our software engineers to work with our network engineers to do something. And I can remember that there was always this pushback, be like, no, no, this is this, and this other thing is over here. And what it sounds like you both are really describing is much more like, it, it's more of an idea than it is a, I mean, it is very physical, go do something actionable with it, but it's much more about how do I, how do I conceptually think and, and look at my infrastructure as part of a larger stack that can just be orchestrated and be observable across a much larger stack of tools that we're using to run the business. And when you do that, you sort of reframe the way your, your, your mindset on what that, what that, what that becomes capable of. And you just said it, Quinn, like when you have all these APIs in your hardware and these things become very programmable, like you said, Susie, then from a software perspective, or just from a business decision perspective, you can make a lot more dynamic changes and modifications across the board, rather than just thinking, I have to update my hardware over here and just release a new piece of code or a new piece of uh, config to that. Yeah. And I would say that uh, if we take a look at the evolution, uh, you know, I like to talk about the evolution of how applications meet infrastructure. You know, and if we think about what that used to look like, it, it was very separate, you know, so the IT teams would build out the network, give you the best possible network that they possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, and then app developers would go off and build those applications and just hope that it could work on the infrastructure that was provided, right? And you would actually change the applications that you wrote based on what the network and the infrastructure could do. So I remember working on video streaming algorithms and sending video across, and we just knew, all right, we have this much bandwidth to work with, <laughs> you know? And it was a miracle. We could get, you know, television streams across at five megabits per second, and then HDTV was 20 megabits per second, but the networks had to come along. But now that we're in this world of kind of cloud applications that need to be distributed everywhere, all sorts of devices attaching, and then an infrastructure that's actually programmable, like for the first time, you can now actually modify the infrastructure when the infrastructure is code to be able to handle those cloud applications. So you no longer need that kind of strict boundary between applications and infrastructure, um, you know, because they can adapt and they can work together. And then likewise, app developers and IT teams and DevOps folks who are kind of in between, they get to work together too. You know, so before they were pretty separate, but now they get to work together. So it's that shift as well. And, and that's, that's actually a really good point because, you know, I came from a network engineering background before coming into DevNet. And one of the scariest things that, that app developers could say was, we want control of the network. And so as, as an infrastructure guy, that was absolutely terrifying because they understood, you know, how to program in, in these different languages, but they knew nothing about how all the different traffic flows and what happened with the hardware. And it, it, it honestly scared me. And, and to your point, Susie, of having when we treat infrastructure as just a, a fungible API, like, I mean, it's Play-Doh, we can move around and do whatever we want with it. The, the network engineers can design something or build something that says, this is how we can scale this out in a proper way. And here's what we can expose to you as an app developer, where you're adding more stress or new applications or we're making changes, shifting traffic. You can have those resources, call those APIs automatically and move that network back and forth. So it's a combination of that, that API glue that we talked about really early on in DevNet. How do we glue things together with how do we get speed and scale? It's really the, the best of both worlds and that operational management 
environment uh, and, and observability kind of, of context as well. It's funny that the, the story that or the thought that comes to mind or like the visual that comes to mind when you say that, Quinn, is uh, um, I don't know if you guys have watched Westworld. Um, I adore that show. And in a, well, at least one or two of the seasons, there is a um, uh, a point where they go into like the data center, so to speak, like the room where the, the big AI that runs everything happens to be. And what you see is and we've seen this in other movies, too, like these big banks of what are supposed to be computers or compute or something. But to your point, Quinn, like it almost is like a face on like a nebula behind it. Like there's some sort of abstract void behind all the faces of these computers. And it almost feels like what you're describing is like all these boxes, these pieces of hardware we put into these racks and power them and cable them and all that type of stuff is like, this is just the entry point. This is just the thing we have to put there. And behind it is almost like this abstract void that we can do whatever we want with it based on what you're describing. It lets you really have that Play-Doh, that level of control um, to merge things together, not just from a like one perspective only, but you can have much more control over how everything is running, not just, well, like you said, Susie, to do this one thing, I need to go buy three more servers, or I have to, oh, they only deployed Windows, or they only deployed this OS, so I can only deploy this type of application on top of it in this way, which is kind of how it used to be, or was for a very long time. Yeah, so I'm curious if uh, those app developers don't don't scare Quinn in his old job as much today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's that whole thing of like self-service network operations, you know, in terms of being able to still like, and, and Jeff, what you were just talking about, about like creating infrastructure, right? Create, destroy, deploy infrastructure. So when you start to think about it that way, you're like, how do I create a cluster and how do I destroy it when I'm, when I'm done? How do I create software? You know, Kubernetes containers, spin those things up, spin them back down. And when you can do those kind of in concert, that becomes really interesting in how we work across those. Yeah, very much so. So I, th I think at the center of all of what you're describing is, uh, these are all really cool concepts. And I think this is a great place for us to tangent a bit into a bit more of the weeds about what this actually could look like. Um, so when we think about the idea of infrastructure as code, you still need to have infrastructure. That's not physically going away. We know that. The cloud gets talked about a ton, and it's as it should. It, it, there's a, a lot of flexibility that comes along with thinking of these things as cloud, whether it's public or private or some sort of hybrid. Um, but we still there's still a box or a group of them someplace that you are doing these things on top of. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what we're really trying to accomplish with all of it is solving some sort of problem or a set of problems. Um, so I guess what I'd like to like to kind of get both of your takes on is sort of what are some places or some ways that we can think about infrastructure as code is actually solving a real specific problem for a business, customer, partner, whoever it happens to be. And yeah, feel, if feel I can, yeah, actually, uh, and by the way, at, at uh, on DevNet site, so at developer.cisco.com slash IAC, infrastructure as code, we actually created a new nice um, infrastructure as code developer center to help you out there. So again, developer.cisco.com slash IAC. Um, one thing that we did, and actually we have our dev advocate, Kareem, uh, who actually helped us create this demo, but it gives a really good example, and I use this in some of my talks. We're actually talking about what um, education, you know, what's going on in education today. And there's applications where, you know, are kids going to school? Are kids going on campus? You know, what will happen? Will kids get sent back home? And what we know is that our education customers had to work really hard to both have in-person offerings when you're in the classroom, send everyone home, be fully remote. And then, you know, in the future, if hopefully, hopefully good things happen with the vaccines, but if people have to come back, they need to send people back and they need to go between again, fully remote, um, you know, fully in person, hybrid and all of that. So you need that type of agility. But the problem that's underlying that is that there's actually applications that they need to run when they're serving people remotely or serving people on campus. And, um, you know, so to be able to spin up um, your educational applications out on the cloud and do it, you know, publicly when they're serving remote and they need to get that reach that they need versus now coming back on campus and then spinning things up in your data centers, getting rid of the cost of what you had to deploy out on the cloud, you know, to basically be able to shift back is really key. So I think these are areas where, um, you know, once again, creating this kind of cloud application environment and doing it either on the public cloud or back home on your uh, private cloud is kind of really key in being able to shift. And then using tools like Terraform and, and others together with uh, things that tie down to the infrastructure. We have something called Intersight, which actually helps us use um, on-prem 
uh, and, and create kind of cloud environments for developers there is really key. From an infrastructure perspective, you know, we talk about the on-prem resources, but again, going back to my network engineering background, I can't tell you how many times that uh, some application team would deploy a new app. Hopefully it wasn't on a Friday, but it always seemed to be. Um, and something would something would go down. It would either affect the infrastructure in a negative way, it would affect reachability of, of, of some very enterprise, you know, critical apps that would just stop being reachable from wherever, whether it was remote or, or actually on the campus. And so uh, some of the things that, that are talked about in, in a, a link off of the IAC page, uh, the, the, we have a, a dedicated page directly for network infrastructure IAC, we talk a lot about CICD pipelines and how we can use that declarative nature of, of some of these automated provisioning tools to incorporate as part of a build process. So as app developers are, are going through and, and building their apps and they want to test a new release, before it even has to go into production, we can have our infrastructure spin up a new a new segmented tenant that is only reachable by those apps and maybe one little leak in and out so you can test reachability. So you're not affecting the entire infrastructure by deploying that app. You can do some canary testing before you do your typical blue green or, or however you want to do that kind of the application in, in prod. But incorporating that as part of the application process. So it's not, again, not two siloed pieces where we need a new tenant for this app. We can combine those two and make sure that overall we get a higher level of reachability and stability of the network through all times of that build process. We talk a lot about those kinds of use cases as well. Now, Quinn, you did say, uh, I just kind of get back to basics for a sec so we don't lose anyone in the audience. You, one of the key words you called out there in the very beginning of that description is, um, the word declarative and like how that plays into this. Can you describe for everyone what you mean by declarative in this case? Yeah. So if we if we look at at our traditional uh, configuration of a device, you're you're telling the device, I want this command on there, or if you're building a, 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 a an Ubuntu server or something like that, and you want to run and uh, install an application, you would do apt, you know, install this app. That's a that's a very procedural type command, and that's something that you have to know the specific syntax of that device and that application or OS that is running on top of that. Declarative allows you to not focus so much on the individual commands. You're, you're worrying about the end state. So using things like Ansible that's very uh, declarative in each task. I just want run apt and here's the programs I want to install. Or Terraform where I talk about scaffolding an entire you know, infrastructure cloud or, or, or VPC or tenant. I focus so much on what I want the end state to be. I don't worry about the individual API calls and how things move back and forth. I, I focus on the end state and then when I push that configuration, you know, either via apply or running an Ansible playbook or through a pipeline that incorporates one of those two things, I get the the, the desired end state that I want, but I'm not worrying about the itty, you know, the, the, the nitty gritty of the individual commands. I, I focus on the big picture of things and those programs allow me to have that level of, of level of abstraction away from those API details. And, and just to add to that, then what's cool about the declarative model is that also you can actually start to set policies and think about it. So you're still setting guide rails and all of that. So you're saying, here's my application policy. Here's the security policy. Here's what I need as I, you know, in, in these declarative models as I roll something out and then my apps can run in it safely, right? They can still have access to the data they need. The data can be protected in the right way. The applications are protected in the right way. And yet they can um, provide the services that they have. So just taking that kind of, policy driven, I'm declaring what my needs are from the mm -hmm. infrastructure uh, so that the applications can go and run across those is really powerful and in a different way of thinking, you know, from the old definition of automation to, to what it means today. Yeah, absolutely. And just to take a quick breather for a second, I want to make sure to call out to everybody watching. We've had at least one comment come through. Thank you so much for that. Uh, one of our commenters on Cisco.com said that uh, everyone's offices look great. <laughs> Thank you for that. We, we appreciate it. Susie and Quinn have it nailed down. I love all the Devies in the background there. Quinn, it's awesome. Where are they? There they go. And the pillow. You had an awesome story about that pillow. Probably for another show, but that's okay. Um, and just a reminder, if you're out there watching on any of the channels, definitely submit your questions throughout. We'll be watching for them. And then in a few minutes, we'll, we'll start jumping into some of those questions and talk through that a little bit. Um, but something I noticed from both of what you said to kind of step back a little bit is... Um, a theme that I'm hearing outside of just the technology of of these things that we're talking about is the ability for what we used to call a network engineer to no longer really be a network engineer. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that sort of in a, 
almost a, an evolution to like a business architect where you get to take all these skills that you've been learning forever. And it's not, they go away. It's they add into now you become even more relevant because you now have the ability to say all this infrastructure I've been designing and building forever still is great. And I'm designing it for you specifically so that we can have this flexibility in how the business is operating. Um, and I can, I just a small story. I can remember a financial services company I worked for before I came to Cisco. And when I started, it was smaller. It is still pretty small, but they had a very small infrastructure, really lean, and they were having lots of challenges and issues because everything was just a single app that ran in one place, and that was it. And by the time I left and building out a team, we had brought in a lot more, you know, flexible. We brought in UCS and other flexible compute and things like that. And the idea behind it was to give them more flexibility so that they could deploy their things wherever they needed to. And by the time I left, you know, they had turned up a whole new online banking system and an internal banking system and upgraded. And they just these projects could flow more smoothly because there was more ability to, like, navigate what you had. And I just I wanted to kind of bring that up to both of you that how do you see how do you see things like infrastructure as code or even Susie, you mentioned it sort of the evolution of what we call automation. How do you see that as helping people in their careers um, grow and learn and support the businesses they work for? Oh, it is so about the people. Um, so as much as we say infrastructure is code and automation and there's great new technologies uh, behind all of that, super, super important. But what's also important is how the people are able to use those to get all of that, you know, all that power and turn it into real life for businesses. Um, so I love our network engineers out there. Um, when I take a look and I really think about it, and this was in the heart of why we started DevNet, um, you know, if you just think about it, like they're, they're heroes. I mean, so just the, you know, a network engineer, right? You know, what, what Quinn did in his job, you know, he's just like, ah, did they make that change? Now I need to keep this thing up. How many nights and weekends did you spend, Quinn, doing all of that? <laughs> Countless, countless, nights. countless. <laughs> Where's my change control process? <laughs> you know, and 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 then if you take kind of the heart of that person, like of Quinn, is you know, as you guys were doing these areas, I mean, they're working. You guys are working day and night to keep the system alive because you know businesses are on this thing. That there's users that are on it. Like you need to keep that business going, and the amount of technical expertise you have to put in to know to do that well is really important. So, you know, the network engineers are superstars because, you know, they have a lot of technical um, knowledge. Uh, they've really learned to build mission critical stuff to put this thing to life. And then they keep that thing alive, <laughs> you know, and kind of take calls because they, they're very much in service of, of people, of customers, of businesses that, that use them. But now if we go to this next chapter with infrastructure as code, all of a sudden there's cloud applications using what's now a programmable network and a programmable infrastructure. And if I think about who's the one who I want running that and bringing that to life, I want that network engineer who's learned about all of the modern software skills and has now mastered and moved that on. Because when you take that combination of that engineering excellence, that mindset, that operational mindset, and you add in those software skills and that software knowledge, you can control everything, right? And you can do it in a very competent way. So to me, it's that kind of combination. And, and you think of just the people, I mean, the world is just open to jobs, you know, as we're like bringing this forward and enabling cloud clusters, as we're enabling cloud applications, and we wanna keep our business secure. A bank still needs to keep their data and serve their customers and have their applications running, but do it securely um, and at scale that they need then it's it's amazing and you know it does definitely provide that career evolution uh for uh for the networkers who want to come up as well as the software developers who come in they need to come back and learn some about the infrastructure as well and just to make that combination work right and these people need to be able to talk to each other and work well together yeah i, I totally agree it's one of those things i noticed um i i mean many of us have but i've noticed it a lot in talking to um when I was still in the field talking to customers on a regular basis that the folks out there who sort of like, I don't want to say got it, but like had that light bulb moment, like, oh yes, this makes sense. It's it's when they realize that learning the multiple skills like you just described gives them a level of context for what other people do and how they view, like get, like lets them see their perception of like what you do. And it makes you, it makes them so much more valuable to the company because now what they can say is, well, I see the challenges you're having. I understand this side, but I also understand a bit of what you're doing on the software side. 
I think I have, I understand what challenge you're running into. Let's talk that through and figure out that problem. And I think this, these skills allow for that, allow for that, what we would have called a classic network engineer to become even more valuable to any organization or just the world in general, because they have that understanding of how all the underpinning to the infrastructure. And I literally mean that, like thinking about it, like the roads and the bridges and everything else in the country, like it's that underpinning of everything that you need in order for everything else to fit on top of it. And they just become so much more valuable. Um, Quinn, since it's been, Susie and I talked about this a little bit, I wanted to kind of give it over to you because you did this a lot before. And I am very curious how, how that transition for you, because you know, you've kind of made this sort of transition into much more of a software developer these days. How how has that affected you? And like how has that actually gone for you? Well, I mean, so so my first experience was even before I, I came to Cisco. Uh, uh, but my previous employer, they had a software development arm, and we were working on some proof of concepts with some very early, early model-driven programmability uh, use cases on iOS XR with an iPad app. And it was a really, it was an interesting experience, but the, the software developers knew uh, Python. We were using YDK Pi at the time, um, and they understood that really well, but they had no idea of the actual infrastructure, like what does all this stuff mean? And I was kind of building and, and putting that all together, but I had no way to empathize with well, here's where you need to look in these models, or here's how you need to call that. And it was a what took what should have taken about 30 minutes was like a two week ordeal working back and forth with these individuals because we just we we couldn't see eye to eye. And it wasn't that we weren't both trying to go to the the, the same spot. It's just we couldn't communicate. Um, like I said, that was like 2015 ish time frame. So very very early days. Um, you know, you fast forward that to today and and working as a as a field SE at Cisco and, and seeing my customers trying to increase their agility or we've got to manage scale. I, I, we had a couple I had a couple of uh, large utility customers that were having to manage geogra very large geographic areas. And you can't do that without making sure that a your infrastructure is manageable, making sure that you have a scalable way of, of orchestrating these changes. And when you push those changes, you know that they're going to work. So having some kind of lab and test, you know, environment where you can make sure that that's going right. The only way that you can connect all those pieces is through automation. So seeing them start their journey where I was a few years prior and saying, I, look, I can empathize. I know right where you guys are at and here's how you can go forward and, and, and move in a way that is going to not only help you upskill, but make sure that you gain empathy with the software developers and the application developers and the people that are going to be, you know, writing software on top of that infrastructure. And you could see the light bulbs come, come on. And I think having that early experience and and helping other people through that has allowed me to get a very large uh, perspective on things and then being part of, of several online communities and you know, we talk about this upskilling our ccies aren't going away the people that are really good at what they do are still going to be really good at what they do but they're going they have the ability to pivot now and focus on those higher order things how do we make sure that what we're doing is business process centric is orchestrated in a secure way that we have the proper policy and once those automations get in place that frees them up to do okay now how can we assist with that business transformation how can we help move to different areas how can we you know cut those costs out of there. Um, so it's it's just been a really good experience for me personally to make that transition, to see the community following suit with that and, and making sure that everyone is saying, no, we're, nothing is, is changing fundamentally. You're still gonna have to be really good at networking, but having that empathy to work with those other folks is gonna be crucial moving forward. And, and if I can just kind of add on to that, um, you know, what I'm seeing in the leaders who need to run these departments is they need to even reorganize their teams in some ways to be able to have the security folks talk to the networking folks, talk to the app developers and the business uh, DevOps folks and everything there. There's a lot of mixture in there. And the people who can speak a common language <laughs> with the others, you know, that's what Quinn was talking about is, you know, uh, you know, now I have something to talk about, like the network engineer can speak to the application developer because they're both talking about CI CD pipelines and DevOps, and it's not a foreign language, it's actually a common language. Um, you know, we actually have our Cisco DevNet certifications that we launched just over a year ago, and uh, we actually designed them with exactly that goal, is if you, if you go to developer.cisco.com slash certification, then you can see that the topics that are covered in these DevNet certs are, you know, really to teach you about infrastructure as code, automation, software, just, you know, starting with, you know, APIs, authentication, rate limiting, you know, all of these areas, virtual, uh, virtual machines, virtualization, 
uh, and then you know climbing up to all of these different layers. And the idea is to give people a common language. And that's what we've heard from the community is before they, you know, when I started DevNet, I thought it was around giving everybody the software skills, the software capabilities to be able to do what they need to do. But a bunch of people said, it actually uh, gives me a language, you know, to speak about software, DevOps, APIs, cloud. And that's what's helped me because now we can work together as teams to, to do what we need to do. Yeah, I, I something you just actually pieces of what both of you just said really resonated for me. Like you, Quinn, you you had a lot of really good information to share there. And one of the things you said that really struck me is the word empathy. And you combine that with what you just said, Susie, with people going through. One example would be, you know, if you're looking to start out with these things, you go to our developer.cisco.com slash start now. We'll we'll put all. By the way, for everyone watching, we're going to put our folks are going to put these things in the in the various chat windows or portals you're you're viewing through them so you'll get these links they'll be accessible to you but our start now place is a really good location to go and begin your journey and then we get to the process the point of like i really want to do a deep study for these certs you get that you get the context you get to learn how to speak the language of these other people so you combine better understanding how they're talking about things and the way they view them with a level of empathy that you you may not have had before and now the two of you or the teams of you can work together so much better. I think that was even like the genesis of what DevOps was supposed to even be is put these different people together on these teams, like an agile style team, put them together to think about how do we do this job together as opposed to here's the network team, here's the app dev team, here's the, you know, get the get docs team, like whatever, like there are these teams and we throw stuff over the wall to each other and tickets move around or what have you. Now we can be part of the same team and get things done a lot faster in smaller chunks because we understand how to talk to each other, what we're all trying to accomplish, which I think is huge. Um, okay, quick tangent to the social side of things because we have a lot of people watching around, which is awesome. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you are out there, we got a few notes about folks chiming in from various parts of the world, which is awesome. We've got some folks from Nigeria, which is super cool. Um, so wherever you're watching from, if you wanna post in your various chat windows, where you're watching from, we'd love to hear from you. Um, also, and Quinn, this is a shout out to you. Uh, somebody. Post it in there. Well, where do I get a Debbie? <laughs> because you've got them on your back shelf. Um, so if you want, if you want to get a Debbie, um, engage with Cisco DevNet on Twitter, and we can talk to you about how that could possibly happen for you. Um, Quinn, one question did come through. I think this is a good time to start taking some of these questions. One that came through was from Meredith, and she asked, um, "I noticed there's a lot of uh, a lot on developer.cisco.com around DCNM and VXLAN. Do you see that changing in the future?" No, I mean, so the the there's been some some evolution just like with everything within cisco there's a lot of evolution that happens within our product lines and 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 dcnm um was one of those products that was has been around for quite a while and so making that api centric and api driven has been a kind of a a process within the business unit um i can say that we are working on building out some sandboxes around DCNM and VXLAN and being able to leverage infrastructure as code, not only around you know your ACI-centric fabrics, but being able to do the same thing with DCNM. So your Ansible playbooks, your Terraform plans, being able to test those APIs against an actual fabric uh, backed by, by NXOS switches and being able to build all that out. Uh, we've got some border leaves. It'll be a really interesting and, and really cool sandbox to pull together. Uh, that should be out shortly. Uh, I'm putting some finishing touches on, on the actual sandbox, working through testing, make sure the automation is there uh but that should be out um you know shortly as is the best i can get for right now on the exact date <laughs> no worries no worries okay so thank you for answering that that's fantastic and please keep the questions coming we'll we will definitely get through as many as we can before the show's over today actually and um, if so, i can just build on that for a oh, second yeah. jeff is just along yeah. those lines you know what what you'll see on the infrastructure is code page um in the dev center there is that we are building in more and more automation, actually, in on DevNet Automation Exchange as well. So developer.cisco.com slash automation. Um, if we take a look at these different areas, um, you know, we're integrating in with more Cisco products. You know, so more of our Cisco products have APIs. You want to use them in these different automation and orchestration frameworks. Um, so, you know, having the Ansible play, uh, playbooks, the Terraform providers, we're going to be getting more things hooking into there. You know, certainly we have NSO um, that allows us to also orchestrate in different ways. So they're really all working towards this kind of infrastructure as code design paradigm. So we'll see more and more resources that connect uh, more products into those frameworks and hopefully help all of you, our customers and partners, put them into your workflows uh, in ways that make sense as you go on your automation journey. 
and I, I do want to jump in yeah. there real quick. So, so I know we've, we've talked a lot about the data centers. We talked about Intersight. We've talked about DCNM, ACI, MSO, and all those things are there. But what we're, to Susie's point, is, is it's not just the data center where we're starting to need the speed and agility. We have similar types of, of, of providers and playbooks out there for something like DNA Center. We have things for ASA firewalls. We have things for FTD. We have SecureX that's orchestrating a lot of these things that is also API driven. So we're it, the speed and agility came from the cloud centric pieces of things because they needed to move fast, which said, okay, now we need to have our, our, our cloud data center and our on-prem data center move at the same speed. But now we're seeing that everywhere across the entire or, uh, organizational infrastructure from campus to wireless to security and the data center as well. So there's a lot of other things that are out there that support that infrastructure as code paradigm. I know we're focusing on the data center. We've talked a lot about the data center so far, but it's everywhere. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we go to edge edge use cases, right, in SASE type architectures, but a lot of stuff is going on like in retail stores, in coffee shops, right? So how do you actually also make sure you're extending those same policies uh, out to the edge and using those same declarative models across all of this kind of infrastructure as code paradigm really helps to, to have that coherence, you know, from the data center out to the edge, you know, across public and private clouds, but connecting to users and devices. Mm -hmm. um, Super key. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I do want to touch a little bit on, since we're talking about this a bit, um, we've talked about some of these concepts, like at the bigger picture, and I know we kind of dipped into some of the, the, the more basic definitions, but one question I did have for both of you, um, Quinn, maybe this is a good one to start with you, is could you walk us through maybe some of the tools, some of the tools that we might consider to be part of infrastructure as code, not just the infrastructure, but we, we on DevNet, but in general in the industry, a lot of focus is put on terms like Ansible and Terraform and whatever else, but maybe a quick walkthrough of like what some of those tools look like, why they're important, um, and how they kind of generally fit into what the idea of infrastructure as code is and what it's trying to solve for. Yeah, I mean, so so infrastructure as code is kind of that general term, and and again, going back to the, that old model of like server administration, it was a very manual process, you know, we can all remember installing Windows 98 off of, you know, the CD-ROM or 95 off of floppies and next, 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 type a bunch of keys and move forward. It was a very manual process. And so um, the, the tools that came out of that were, were very much centered on on server automation and orchestration. Um, and that's where the whole IAC code came or concept came from. But it's really anything that we can model with code. So if you can create code that can provide some configuration towards a device, um, that could be considered infrastructure as code. But where getting back to where I started earlier is the, the industry's kind of accepted those declarative models that provide that abstraction. I just need to make sure I have the right, you know, Ansible collection or Terraform provider installed and, and we don't have to worry about that nitty gritty. So a lot of the terms that you'll your tools that you hear about are Ansible and Terraform just because they're the, the, the most widely accepted and, and used uh, tools that are out there. Um, but uh, You'll also hear things like uh, Cisco NSO that Cisco, uh, Susie mentioned, which is very much focused on kind of a bring your own IAC model that you provide whatever declarative nature you want, building that service or that um, action on top of NSO to say, I want to configure maybe this VXLAN fabric and I only want to do it with these key parameters and I just, I have it auto generate everything else, or I just kind of have it as part of my template where it just is this value statically. So those are our typical IAC type uh, tools uh, that are in use today. And all those are available on, on the DevNet website, but typically where they'll fit in, I mean, NSO provides a whole MACD so that, that move edge, change, delete, the whole CRUD operations available through it. Um, but what a lot of people will do if they're using more of an open source type model, they'll leverage things like te uh, Terraform to create that scaffolding. And I use that term a lot because it's, you're setting up that structure. We may not need to worry about placing all the windows in the right spots. We're building that, that, that uh, uh, scaffold, that, that set of ladders that we can start building other things on top of or with. And then they'll, they'll provide that infrastructure through Terraform and then use something like Ansible to provide those incremental changes throughout that whole process. The beautiful thing of it is, is that the nature of Terraform allows us to do the full set of operations. So if I've created something, I can then delete it through Terraform uh, without having to, to, to say, I've got to remove this, this, and this. Terraform handles that entire process uh, natively through its, through its provider. Ansible, you know, we're providing that very task-driven uh, automation uh, and changes through each individual task. But um, like I said, they both have their places. There's no, like, we prefer one versus the other. It's really about how it fits into your business process and what your current 
uh, provisioning operations teams are using. If they're using Terraform, it may make sense for you to uh, scaffold your infrastructure using uh, Terraform. If they're an Ansible shop, you might get a little resistance moving to Terraform if they're already Ansible, so you may want to use that. But the, the beauty of it is, is we provide a lot of, of, of labs and, and sandboxes that can leverage both of those tools, so you don't have to have an allegiance or a favorite. Uh, you can use whatever makes sense in your business process. Yeah, and if I could uh, just jump into that, so, to some of you, it might be like, what language are they speaking? <laughs> you know, as we kind of get into <laughs> some of these different areas. Um, and, uh, uh, but it is within your grasp, you know, it is very much within your grasp. So we actually have a lot of learning labs around it that, you know, Quinn was just referring to, but we have, you know, start automating Cisco ACI with Ansible you know, or start automating Cisco ACI with Terraform. You know, how do you do application and network policy with these? Um, we have a Terraform Dev Center. You know, you can actually take a look at using Intersight with HashiCorp. Sorry, I'm just reading down here. So if you don't mind me looking, um, <laughs> you know, so uh, we have new sandboxes with Intersight and a Terraform sandbox, but we actually have plenty of learning labs so that you can get in there. And once you, it's, it's kind of, I know many of, some of you, many of you hopefully are, have been with DevNet and before you did a DevNet start now, and you know, then you started to do learning labs, maybe even got certified, you learned to speak that new language. This is just taking it one more step and we have another set of learning materials and, and you'll be able to get in with all of this as well. I think that's a really good call out, Susie, specifically because I, to your point, Sometimes it can sound like we're all talking about this like foreign language. It, it, we touched on that earlier. Like when you take the DevNet cert, you learn these things, you start to learn the language someone else is talking, you build some empathy. But if you don't understand that, it can either feel daunting or like, yeah, there's too much friction here. I'm just going to go do something else. Um, and I think one of the key parts about what both of you said is that all of these things that we've talked about, whether it's, you know, Ansible or Terraform or the variety of other tool names you hear out there when it comes to DevOps, like the 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 Jenkins and the you know puppets and the chefs and all these other terms that we talk about. The the key to remember is that these are all just tools. They're they're tools that accomplish something that you're trying to accomplish. And none of the, it's not that any one of them necessarily. I know this, there could be easy discussions here, but like it's not that one of them is better or worse than the other. It's that they all accomplish a goal. If to your point, Quinn, if if you already have, if you're at a company that already uses Ansible heavily, okay, then do your automation through Ansible because it's probably less friction to just work on that. Conversely, I worked with a customer that already used Terraform. There's no reason for me to try to push on them. Hey, you should look at Ansible for this. You already use Terraform. No big deal. Let's just talk about how you can do it there. It's it's a, they're in, they're tools that enable you to to solve a problem at the end of the day. And which one you pick, while it's up for discussion, sometimes isn't as important as you have it. Go use it. Find ways to solve your problems with it. Um, there's been a lot of really good questions coming through, and I want to jump into a couple of them. Um, one of them is, and this is uh, really, I think a really good one is, how can we take advantage, this comes from uh, Shekhar on YouTube, how can we take advantage of infrastructure as code in troubleshooting the network? And maybe that's a little bit too narrow focus as uh, like the network, because ISC is really a bigger thing, but I think it's a good question to, to focus on if we can. Yeah, if I, uh, one kind of simple thing is, uh, as we take a look, starting with infrastructure as code, and then we back off a little bit and think about configuration as code. So if we just kind of like simplify it and just think of all of those config files across all of your network devices, um, you know, and then how do we take a look at those? So sometimes they say the first step in DevNet, we always talk about walk, run and fly, right? So it certainly applies to all of this. But if we take a look at um, looking at all of your config files is configuration as code then what you can actually be doing is looking across, these are all kind of machine readable files, comparing to golden templates, and then seeing where did you lose compliance? Like, where do you have compliance? Where might you have lost compliance um, in some different way? So just being able to do things like uh, taking a look across, but having kind of loops that allow you to do this, you know, just regularly, you know, even almost continuously, to just see where has something drifted? You know, where did someone have to get in overnight and provide access to a new user for something? Oh my goodness, now I have a breach of some sort. Just doing that continuous um, uh, view can help you with troubleshooting. Uh, but go ahead, Quinn, you have more there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a great case of, of trying to make sure that we have, uh, using standard templates infrastructure to, to, if we're gonna do something, it's gonna be the same everywhere. We don't wanna make snowflakes, they melt. Um, 
but being able to to compartmentalize and have that inf that the, the configuration as code being able to be parsed out as something that's machine readable so we have structured data that we can query very quickly across all these different devices you know the other track that I was kind of kind of pivot to a little bit is if we have things that that are using infrastructure as code, then it creates a much easier way for us to have a self healing feedback loop, if you will. So being able to leverage things like Terraform plans with integrations with other applications, service meshes, et cetera, where if an application is is uh, providing a web front end to your, uh, uh, if you've got a service providing a web front end to your application and that web front end suddenly dies, well, if you're constantly monitoring that web application and all of a sudden it drops down, you can have something provide a feedback loop that says, now we're going to remove that from a load balance type pool or remove it from the, the mesh of application that service discovery. So yes, we had control troubleshoot but we're not having to troubleshoot with a p1 outage of that application we can say okay we're, we're a little bit degraded we have to worry about capacity but it's not a hard down issue so if we, we create things with infrastructure as code we can start doing those self-healing kind of that intent-based networking type of of uh, feedback loop where the infrastructure is controlling infrastructure yeah, yeah and I if like i can that. just also add in on that um another thing to that um this allows you to build in is your observability and your full stack observability. So, you know, as everything is digitized, you're using these practices, what you really want to build in is just being able to uh, really see and, and monitor everything that's kind of going on in these different ways. Uh, so if you look down from the network layer, you know, what what's the access? What are the routes? What are events? What are anomalies? What's going on here to security? You know, are we seeing um, abnormal events? Are there threats that are going on? How do I integrate in? Is this just a one-off for me? Or is there actually, you know, kind of bigger uh, threats that are going on in different places? So using that threat intelligence is super key as well up through application, right? So how do I look at my application performance? How am I monitoring my different links? You know, how do I see what's going on? You want to build all of that visibility in. You want to just architect that into what you're building, uh, which certainly helps as well. Yeah, absolutely. And one other uh, kind of memory I'm having is about um, in the another part of troubleshooting that I've I've dealt with in the past too is like the simple the, the like I don't want to say the simple but the sometimes not as obvious but it happens way too often is the like something just got changed a config got pushed one line one access one ACL got changed one place that prevented everybody this happened at my last company a lot where we had a, we had a firewall that was really old and had like forty thousand lines of ACLs in it and like one gets removed or one gets modified and like half these applications break because no one can remember why that thing happened. And something as simple as a version control system using GitHub or, you know, Bitbucket or whatever else you want to use, but some sort of version control system, to your point, Susie, thinking of, it's not infrastructure as code, but like configuration as code, like just treating your config files as if they are just a piece of code, your, your version, you're keeping track of through something like a Git, like, um, like Git or GitHub or whatever the tool is can really help save you time when it comes to troubleshooting. Just go back and say, well, let's just check there real quick. Let's just do a quick diff and just see, did something at a basic level get changed before we start like digging into all these big, huge tools that we have to see where the thing broke. It's like that thing that broke 10 steps down the line may just really have, and I've had this happen, where midnight, something's broken, someone's trying to use online banking someplace. Oh God, everyone's hair's on fire. And it turns out that like, one little line item of code or config changed in one place that trickled down all these other problems but you're, if, if you want to troubleshoot all of this stuff, it's so easy to go, but this broke, let's go look at that. It's like, well, no, yes, sure. But we, we sometimes want to start the basics. So having something like a version control system in there in place can really help you with that. It can also help with those, those processes that aren't as glamorous, but have to be in place at companies like a change management process where there's a change control board and you go meet and say, I want to do this change. And like having these processes in place, while they're not always the pretty thing to talk about, they really do help with preventing outages before they even get there because you get more awareness to them in advance and you create some of that structure up front. I think that's uh, so important because when we when we think about it, let's say uh, yeah, I'm kind of speaking to some of the IT leaders and the business and the DevOps leaders and everything there. It's one thing to say, all right, you know, now your people have these skills, right? So so and so has skilled up and now they can go and do it. But you actually need to create the process around them, right? Because, you know, everybody the app teams need to come in, you know, the ops folks need to come in, you know, SecOps, DevOps, you know, just your IT ops overall need to be coming in. 
Uh, so that whole the change management processes, you know, everything else are all super important to build into it as you go on this journey. Absolutely. Um, so uh, on to uh, one of the questions that came through was about some resources. And we've mentioned this URL a couple times, but the question was, where can we find more info about the Cisco and HashiCorp collaboration? I mentioned Terraform a number of times. Um, and so everyone, everyone out there, the URL is developer.cisco.com slash IAC. That's our infrastructure as code dev center on DevNet. You can go look at all kinds of resources. As Susie was reading you off some of the, the resources at the bottom of the page a little bit earlier, there's labs. Quinn, I know you, Actually, do you want to talk about that? I know you've got a number of the content. Much of the content that's there is actually created by you. Segway set up. <laughs> yeah, no, per perfect, perfect lead in there. Yeah, so so with that that whole IAC push, we have a lot of things that are centered around uh, I um, ACI and the multi-site orchestrator from Cisco. So we have labs that you know Susie was mentioning about ACI and Terraform. ACI and Ansible has been updated. We have Terraform plus uh, ACI and Terraform plus MSO that leads you not only to control one ACI fabric but multiple ACI fabrics uh, using those you know IAC principles. So you can have uh, things coherent across multiple sites in your data center. So we've got a lot of that content out there. Really good learning labs. In fact, I wanted to bring up earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt the conversation. Um, some of the TMEs that I work with in, in the ACIBU have had people come up and say, you know, where can I learn about Terraform? And these are, are very strong ACI engineers. And he said, like, I don't have the, you know, I want to teach you, but it's a lot of effort. And you can just go to this one location, go through these learning labs and learn the foundations of how to build, uh, you know, Terraform orchestration or Ansible orchestration with these tools. And they've come back, you know, several days later and said, all right, I get it now. I, I totally understand how to use these tools tools with, um, you know, with ACI and MSO. Uh, so th they've shown themselves already to be a great resource and it doesn't have to be intimidating when you when you understand how the uh, the providers and and, and tap or playbooks and I'm sorry, modules are, are coincide with how ACI is formed or how MSO is formed or whatever tool is seeing that in its live form and seeing it work. Oh, I can make a connection to this and bring it back into my real world environment. So a lot of content out there. I know we have some stuff around uh, Intersight with Terraform and being able to provision some some app development uh, type stuff with IKS. It's just there's a ton of of things out there with with uh, um, IAC that's that's located on that landing page. And I know for everyone watching, there's we've talked about a lot of different resources we have available. DevNet is, as Susie has mentioned, is the center of all of this stuff for our, our program, your programmability journey, automation, infrastructure as code. So the best place is go to developer.cisco.com. And if you really want to get started, just go to slash start now. That's a great place to just begin your journey in that walk, run, fly process. From there, you can go to a variety of places like our dev centers, including what Quinn just talked about with all the things available on infrastructure as code, all the labs and modules he talked about, you can jump off if that's a place you want to go next. Um, if you want to really focus on our certifications, all that, all those resources are located there too. And you don't need to remember these URLs, I promise. Um, our folks on the back end are going to be posting these things in the chat throughout. So if you need more information, we can totally get that for you. Um, actually, that leads into, I think, probably our final question for the day. Um, Susie, this one came directly for you is, it came through to LinkedIn. Um, can you talk a little bit about the DevNet certified partners and like what partners get, what about their employees, things like that? Oh, awesome. Yes, I'm very excited to talk about them. And I was trying to think about how could I get this in? <laughs> I, uh, I just want to thank you because uh, many of many of our partners out there are really embracing this and in, in leading first. And I know many of you work for partners as you're going on this journey. Um, but what's been interesting in our DevNet journey is that, uh, you know, we've kind of gone through and the, some of you jumped in early and you're just like, this is really important. We need to do this. You know, automation is important. Software skills are important. We need to build it in. Um, but what happens is now our customers are asking for it. You know, customers need to deploy cloud applications. People need to automate their, um, their infrastructures and they want to make all of this work securely. And they're going to our partners. And we have our DevNet specialized partners, uh, partners who've been kind of skilling up and having a number of DevNet certified employees, which certainly just certifies and validates the skills and capabilities that they have. They've become DevNet specialized partners. It means they've um, actually done a test where they've actually you know, sent code up, sent code back into the DevNet sandbox, have used these in really good ways. It means that they are actually helping customers today in terms of uh, solving some of these problems using these software practices. So software, infrastructure as code, DevOps, and everything there. 
Um, so we actually have 13 DevNet specialized partners. Um, uh, actually, we'll put in a link so that we can actually show you guys uh, because you know they're able to, once again, you're able to help customers in different ways. For those of you who uh, work at a partner, your partner has not yet, be, your company and business has not yet become specialized. We certainly want you to do that. So you can uh, learn more about that on DevNet. And we actually have some videos where we spoke to a number of our partners, I include, I know it sounded like Meredith might have asked a question in there. Um, Bob Belkowski, CEO of Logicalis, uh, you know, from WWT, uh, we had Meredith and Joel King. Uh, Jose Bogorin from Altis. Uh, you know, we had just a great set of um, people coming in, Brad Haas from Presidio, who actually gave us different types of interviews and just talked about what it meant to them. Uh, so we will post in a link here uh, to, to, to show these. Awesome. Thank you, Susie. And I, I don't know. I don't know how it's been an hour that we've been talking. It does not feel like it's been an hour. <laughs> I think we have <laughs> so much more that we could talk about around this. But to wrap up for today, um, Susie, I'll hand it to you. Is there anything you want to, any final thoughts you want to leave the audience with today? Yeah, I would just like to say that, again, this is more in your uh, walk, run, fly journey. Uh, so, you know, before we said speak the language of software, and it was about learning GitHub in Postman and kind of doing those things. Uh, if and this is just the next evolution of that, where we get to look at what does automation mean today? It means infrastructure is code. And there's another set of tools that you get to use. Uh, you know, And so it's really just that next step in the journey. And we're super excited to work with you as we all kind of lead the way in bringing cloud applications into the network. So um, thank you for everything that you've done. And we just want to continue this conversation. Awesome. Thank you. And Quinn, over to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll piggyback on, on what Susie said, and, and it, it, it is a journey, um, but it's not one that anyone should be scared of. You know, I've been in, in network engineering and architecture for 15 years, uh, made the transition. It's it's an incredible skill to have, and all of the resources that are available to you are available through DevNet. It's something that I think everyone should at least have that fundamental understanding, that ability to create the empathy with the users, because this isn't going away. This isn't a fad. Um, it's going to be here to stay. And, and being able to at least understand and empathize and work with the teams that can help build those large scale things, even if it's not you directly being able to contribute and help with that, is just another step in that, in that uh, career progression. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, you know, touch on that obviously and then you know for anyone who has been to uh cisco devnet and has looked at the labs looked at the resources in sandbox you can you already know it's not static we're, we're always changing things we're always adding new content so it's not just a point in time reference as the industry is changing uh you know early on everyone was talking about chef and puppet and ansible is this newcomer and now we're talking about ansible and terraform we've got cloud formation we've got lots of kubernetes stuff app centric um development type things the industry is changing and within DevNet we're changing as well. So even if you've been there once or twice, maybe it was last year, check it out again. Keep, you know, keep that as a browser tab that's always open because the industry is changing. We're going to be changing with it. We want to help guide you down further down that walk, run, fly journey. And if Perfect. I can add one more thing is not like, of course, we want to help you with it. And we also invite you to contribute to it. Um, so we have automation exchange, code exchange. If you have code entries that you want to submit because, you know, hey, you've automated this or you've used this in a certain way, you write your code. Chances are if you made it for yourself, it's going to be useful to somebody else too. So please contribute it back. And we want to showcase what you've built and how you can really share that with uh, your DevNet community and colleagues. Uh, so just thank you for that as well. It's all about all of you, the community. Absolutely. Thank you, Susie. That's a really good call out. And just for everybody to make this really simple, there's a lot of links we've talked about today. All of this content you can find is all at developer.cisco.com slash something. So slash IAC for <laughs> infrastructure's code. And you guys slash partner. We had the entire partner portal there. Um, our slash automation for automation exchange. There's a lot of resources available. And yeah, I the automation exchange is a, and code exchange are great places to go, not just look for things that can help you solve problems, but help you feel a little bit more confident about when you do find a way to solve your own problem, share that with other people because that's how other people are gonna learn too. And all about this is building that community so you feel like there's a place you can go to learn from and to solve the problems you need and just continue to grow. So. Susie and Quinn, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate being able to do this with you. This has been a blast. Um, and then for everybody watching, thank you. 
these live streams are so much more fun because we have an audience that we get to talk to and enjoy this stuff with. Um, check out the developer website whenever you can. Um, Infrastructure's code, start now. Hope you have an amazing day and we will see you all really soon. Bye guys.